All right. Tonight, um, I, um, I just posted an interview um, that I did with uh, Ruben Gallegos, uh, a nice fellow that runs IRF Authentics. And uh, we talk about um, my creator on character, uh, Helena, quite a bit, her origin, where she came from, the whole you know idea with the story and what she does and where she's going and as much as I can share. And um, Ruben was kind enough to do a um, exclusive variant of the first issue of the book. And um, as you can see, here's a copy of it. Uh, it's based on the uh, Simonson uh, first appearance of Beta Ray Bill cover. And um, yeah, I had a lot of fun doing it. It's uh, the same guts as the other issues. It's still got, you know, for people who like the, the pull out posters, you can pop out this poster in the middle and hang it up on the wall. I don't think anybody's done that yet, um, but there were only a hundred of these printed. Uh, it says it on the back. It's got his Instagram, uh, his whatnot store, and uh, even his phone number that he wanted on there. So if you're interested in buying the boxes, they go live in five days. I did like 50 sketch covers and they'll all be mixed in. Um, you know, Helen has gone through a journey. This is the regular cover. Obviously, we did a blank sketch that I do these drawings on. Um, this one I really liked just because it's more of a story. She's just trapped in this cave and fighting this uh, very Ray Harryhausen-inspired monster. Um, and then this is just one that I did the other day that is for going to be watercolored so that I have a color piece. But what we're working on tonight is actually a page from the book. Um, the other day I posted the previous page. which I will share here. This is the previous page, um, finished inked. We're not gonna get this far tonight, obviously, but you know, this is just a six panel grid. It's mostly about storytelling. You know, they, the previous page, they go to sleep. Helena wakes up. There's a jingle sound effect that I will put in, in the lettering, just jingle, 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 jingle. And uh, she doesn't know what it is. And she looks over and one of the people she's traveling with is missing. Uh, she wakes up her brother. He doesn't know what's going on. Grabs her axe. And then all throughout the background, kind of like Ken Bruzenak, you know, it says jingle, 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 you know, in the background. And she goes off into the woods wondering if this, you know, this noise is coming from her, her traveling companion. And what I'll show you is when I work on pages, I do a big layout page that I work on. And you can see in red where I have the sound effect. There's no words other than this sound effect until you get to panel three, where she finds her companion, her friend here. And she's like, what are you doing out here? And hey, didn't you hear that noise? And you know, she's a little suspicious that he disappeared. And we still have the, the sound effect. And she, he says that way. And then they go off into the woods together following the sound. And um, here it's revealed that it's a bell. We don't know what, what it's on or what, what's going on, but it's a little bell that's making this jingle noise throughout the story. And, uh, you know, I don't remember if it's the next page or the page after. There's a splash page coming up that reveals it. But what I do here is you can't see this. We've got it on a light box. I'm going to turn off this light, and you can see through it. And this is where I start the penciling process on a nice clean board. Um, and then I ink it and then, you know, scan it, color it, letter it, all that stuff. But, you know, um, I, I don't have the, the luxury lately of uh, always doing stream specific pieces. So tonight you're just joining me on what I'd be working on, you know, whether you were here or not. So you're just hanging out. We're all just hanging out in the studio. Um, I will be at Colorado Springs Comic Con coming up. Um, it's at the end of August. There's there's a lot of really terrific uh, creators that are going to be there, and, and and especially great for me. Um, and, and the Helena book is that the cover artist uh, John Lucas will be there, and so will this one. See, I pulled out the poster because that's that's the type of collector I am. I like if there's something fun to do, I that do it. And uh, Pat Broderick will also be there. So you could get this book, you pick it up, get it triple signed. 
I don't think my pal Joe has anything in there. I'm going to have to bug Joe. I think he... He'll be there. But this is how I start penciling. I did the I did really a lot of the thinking on the first thumbnail, and then it translates here. It's refined, and then here you'll see like I'm not just tracing. I'm drawing. I'm using this uh, underneath as my underdrawing, and I'm continuing to think of like how where's my light source? In this case, there's a very weak light source from above that's hindered by the the, the trees. Hey, Jonathan. Um, and the light source is weak because it's it's nighttime, so it's a moon, it's not a sun, so a lot of things are very much in shadow. And uh, I really wanted this focus to create a light that you follow from the top of her axe up her shoulder, across the top of her head, down, and then you see the, her carrying this knife. And also in this hand, you see the axe and her front leg coming forward. This part's in silhouette. But the top, like her thigh, you can actually see. So, uh, getting closer to finishing issue two. We're we're we've, we're past the halfway point on on line art on the pages. I just saw my buddy Jesse Lundberg uh, might have some availability to do some flats for me, so I should get him some some work. That way, I can get it colored real quick. And I, and I definitely will, just like the first issue, I will post it one page at a time um, for free for people to read. Um, I realize that, you know, print comics are expensive and I want anybody who wants to read it to be able to read it. Uh, I don't post them all together because I do sell or I will be, I did a big store update on my website. So there's a whole bunch of new stuff in there. I haven't really promoted it yet. Um, but anyone on the stream who wants to sneak in there and get the stuff first, there's a uh, new books, there's new artwork. There's some stuff that I did for previous shows that, um, didn't sell at a show. So put that available for sale on the website. And uh, there's a link um, to my link tree in the description, but it's encnichols.com. Um, I started really going in the direction of the light box for my pencils, especially um, just because I draw messy. I've tried everything I can to learn how to draw clean. I just can't shake it because my thinking process is not always linear. I'm not thinking, you know, this line leads to this line leads to that line, you know, and on this panel, obviously I want some forward motion with her leg coming forward, but I also want it to be very much framed. So you're going to see very, you know, obvious, you know, pyramid or behind her. Um, And I'm still thinking about the muscles, really also thinking about line thickness, which is not something that I spend too much thinking on um, when I'm doing my big layout pages. And then I, I you know, I sell the layouts um, at conventions in my cheap binder. So you can actually get like the process artwork. Because I collect process artwork from other creators, I've got some beautiful preliminaries. I've got I've got one that I love that I got from Bob Hall. That is a um, Conan just sketch on yellow lined paper. I don't know. He's probably talking on the phone or something, and drew these beautiful little studies. And I see, you know, I see what people say about original art collecting. And yes, like the high end stuff has, has become exorbitantly expensive, but there's still wonderful stuff out there by big name creators that you can get for fair prices.
or I shouldn't say fair because they're all fair prices. I would say they're just more attainable for people with limited budgets such as myself. And I've been able to get some really great deals on um, published pages lately. You know, pages for like $25, $35. So the, the deals are out there, but they're not on like, you're not going to get a Jim Lee page for 35 bucks. Although I do wonder, like I do think about, you know, he definitely sold like his Alpha Flight pages back in the day for, for peanuts. You know, and some of those were inked by like Al Williamson or Al, Al Milgram. And I think Wills Pertaccio or Pertaccio inked some of them too. And I read a lot of that stuff. I read, I, I liked Alpha Flight. Even, even some of the post burn stuff was a lot of fun. But I wanted to have an establishing shot, a close-up shot of her realizing that it's low to the ground. She's looking down towards the ground. And then we reveal that there's this, uh, this bell. So we, the reader, actually know. <laughs> Thanks, Ruben. Thirty bucks for a Dan Jurgens page. That's amazing. That's a hell of a get. You should absolutely um, share that. You know, I—I I mean, come on, Dan Jurgens. Like, it's the guy that did Death of Superman. He he created Booster Gold. I mean, yeah, that's that's awesome. That's the thrill of the hunt, man. Thanks, Ruben. Yeah, at the beginning, I, I shared pictures of the, the variant, and uh, there's a link to um, the Instagram in the description. So, And I'll be sharing more stuff over the next couple of days. And I'm going to bug you about uh, which, which sketch covers I can share. Get people excited. Now here, this arm's going back and then like this part of her arm's actually coming forward. So we want a little bit of a bend there. Hey Rodney, hey, thanks for popping in. Thanks so much. Hey, you, you know the drill. Oh, I totally would have picked one up, man. That's 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 a great that's a great deal. That is a great deal. And and, and you know, I mean, just if you want an example of an artist's work, like that's that's how I've mostly collected a lot of like my artwork. I don't have the means to be like, hey, I want to go get this cover or this first appearance or whatever. But like, I put an artist on my list. You know, usually it's a mental list. I don't usually write stuff down for you know collecting stuff. But. Uh, you know, that's, um, that's how I do it. And, I, and I'll, I'll occasionally hit up uh, comic art fans and just search the names. And uh, occasionally I'll hit up uh, Comic Art Tracker. That's another uh, site that I found that aggregates eBay, um, a whole bunch of different resources for collecting original artwork. And that's actually how I found through that. Uh, the page from Marvel Holiday Special Number One, which I talk about in my interview with. Um... Okay, sweet. I, I will. Sh I will share away. We'll do a nice post. Um. But we talk about the my first comic in that um, that interview, and I found that Marvel Holiday Special uh, page I think through that art tracker because it was out of the U.S. It was in Italy. Um, obviously, the shipping was expensive, but like the page was not is not that bad for a Ron Lim Captain America page from you know uh, arguably you know some of his most popular work. Period. You know, because that was 1991. So he's doing Infinity Gauntlet the next year. Uh, 
I want to get some movement in her little uh, cloth here. So I want to avoid parallel lines. If you have too many parallel lines, that completely kills your movement. But this is the beauty of penciling. And there's going to be, like I said, very judicious uh, use of light. Oh, that's amazing. That's a great deal. I mean, come on, 20 bucks for a Stroman page? Larry's and Larry does amazing work. And Alien, Ink by Mark Farmer. So you got like a double threat there. You went on to ink like, you know, the, uh, I would say the majority of Alan Davis's career once Paul Neary wasn't his anchor anymore. Alien Legion pages. That's awesome. I read the graphic novel, uh, Marvel graphic novel of Alien Legion, and I read some of the epic. And then I picked up, there was a Titan miniseries not that long ago, that it was Carl Potts and uh, Larry Stroman. And I think, it, um, God, who was doing the inks? Uh, was it Rob Stahl? I don't remember. But man, it was some sharp looking artwork, man. I'd like to start a Facebook thread where it's like people sharing their like best deal acquisitions, like their budget acquisitions that would, you know, blow people's mind. And obviously, you know, Rodney and, and you know, got a couple other folks in here that have gotten the, the friend rate for sure. You know, de whether they be dealers or, you know, longtime collectors. Because I remember I got a great I got a great commission from um, from Mike Fosberg. We did a we did a pinup trade for each other's books, but then I, I dragged him out to a convention and um, commissioned a, a wonderful two figure um, toned piece from him of Aquaman and Mira. And and he didn't he had never drawn Mira before. He'd drawn Aquaman in a backup story, I think. I think that's what he told me. But he'd never drawn Mira, and uh, yeah, he gave me a, a, a great friend rate deal on it, and I get to look at it every day. Oh, the alien! If I if my audio is terrible, let me know. I have one trick that sometimes fixes it. Uh, yeah, Carl Potts and uh, Larry Stroman uh, did a Alien Legion miniseries with Titan Comics a few years ago. And I don't remember, maybe it was around 2010, 2012. Chris Pacello X-Men page. I mean, are we talking like X-Men Unlimited, Uncanny? Was it when he was doing kind of the Jim Lee riff or was it when he was, when he was very much his own, own thing? Oh, awesome. Townsend's a guy who was everywhere for like, he, you know, he was all over uh, the Matarero run. He was on the Bocello run, Bacalo, however it is pronounced. 
I apologize if I've butchered it and someone who knows him is listening or he is listening. And of course, for people our age, he was all over like Wizard Magazine. Hey, thanks so much, Brian. Hope you're doing well. Just working on a page. And this is my favorite stuff to work on. Like I, I, I'm one of those crazy people that just loves sequential pages. And I know they take forever. And if you were to like ask anybody like what their hourly rate was, like here, I just draw this little plant. Like no one's going to care about this plant, but I think it looks nice. Get a little three dimensionality to it. A little shadow just adds to the ambiance. So you got two wolverines and a nightcrawler. I mean, I always liked his nightcrawler, uh, and, and his wolverine was was one of those that I think he really accentuated the height of the character, which is something that a lot of uh, artists um, tend to ignore. Like his sense of scale was excellent. Like when he'd have him standing or, or arguing with Cyclops, he'd be having to either stand on like his tippy toes or he'd be looking up at him at least. What was that issue where he was like on a motorcycle with Sauron tied up, um, you know, on the back of his motorcycle? That was one of those in the, in the 350s somewhere that Steve Siegel wrote. He wrote some dynamite stuff for that man. And some of it didn't like pay off. And I, you know, I'd read somewhere that, you know, they weren't allowed to bring back the Phoenix or some other stuff that was going on that they wanted to do. And then there was that issue with all those like new X-Men. Yeah, it's right around there. I just don't remember. It's been, God, 20 years since I've read it. And then once the X-Men movie came out, like there were artists drawing like the height of Hugh Jackman for Wolverine. Because they even during like the Ron Garney run didn't have the um, individual costumes. They had the black leathers like in the movie. There were some interesting stories in there with um, what was uh, it was Angel and Wolverine and Stacy. I think her name was Stacy. If you want me to ruin what, what the bell is around, I will. I actually posted a picture a long time ago of the character designs from this page and these people that they run into in the Land of Monsters. I actually... Uh, <laughs> I believe you, Eli. I believe you. I just got to drive up to your place with my with my stuff. That's what I got to do. Or I got to figure out how to how we can both log in because I do actually have my old backup camera that I could I could loan to you. I use a program called Restream. It's um, it's free and it's connected to like all my social media accounts, so I can just tra uh, have uh, one place that sends it everywhere. Yeah, Meryl was there too. Yeah, that was around that time. I always thought Rachel was a cool character. Even going back to like, um, you know, the Claremont stuff, I, I liked her in uh, in Excalibur.
See, what I need to do is that Eli Stone there did a pinup for me for uh, Helena, and we need to get that in the next issue. And then I can go and draw with Eli, and we can talk art and show off his beautiful work. Texture, texture, texture. It's all about texture that points at the faint light source. But yeah, they had that whole issue where they introduced a whole entire new team that didn't didn't pay off. There was like an issue where there was a getaway with Scott and them all in a cabin with um, Iceman. And... Interesting time for that comic because it was still like dominated the sales. So. Right here. You know, anytime I'm drawing like a um, foliage that's moving, I try to show something that twists. So like in this case, I'll use a marker so you can see better. I'm drawing grass, but you don't just want to draw grass, you know, that's like a straight line like that. Like it can be part of the cluster of grass, but what you want to do when you want to show it moving is show the different planes, like show the underside of it like that, like it's t twisting and it just gets a nice dimensionality to it. See right there where I have, the, you can actually see the underneath it. And it's hard to do, you know, it's not easy. That's something that you have to practice at or I've had to practice at. Again, not projecting. I'm sure there are naturals in the audience that don't need any of that practice crap. We're talking about practice. Same thing with like background plants. Like I'm thinking about the three dimensionality. There's like, you can have one leaf facing away, one underneath. This is actually a plant that you see in the wild. Uh, yep, this is a page from, from the next issue of Helena. This is a, the sequel to the page I posted the other day. Talked about it a little earlier. Um, I can show the, uh, here I'll show the layout again. Underneath it here. You see the light. You can see this is the I do this just with markers after I do the little pin up, the little thumbnails and I have in red put where the sound effects are going to be throughout this whole thing and throughout this whole bit of storytelling it's a uh, this jingle sound and it continues from the previous page. It's jingle, 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 jingle. Like Ken Bruzenak used to do it in American Flag where it'd be like blam, 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 blam in the background. And this, it actually weaves through. And in this case, like it starts here, goes behind this leg, in front of this leg, comes down almost as if it's going through her ear and then comes out this side and then around it. And then it's revealed to us that it's a bell. And then here it's behind her, but then between the two of them, so actually visually the subtext is, is that this sound that we can see and they both can hear is between them. And, and we're physically seeing that between them with the sound effect being drawn out behind her, but in front of him. And that's the idea is that the sound effect is this barrier. And then what we do in the next panel is we show them closer together, standing closer together with the jingle still between the two, behind him, but in front of her. And then we show it above both of them once they have both decided, okay, we need to follow this into the woods. And then that's her. There's going to be a contemplative little bubble there. Thank you, Rodney. I knew you could get my sports references. But yeah, then I flip it over and we've got our, um, got our clean board here. Because I draw a messy always have and unfortunately i think always will no matter how much i've tried no matter how many editors are like draw tighter 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 every time i draw tighter it loses its energy and, and i've even had them tell me that so it's like how do you how does one get a tight clean line but re retain an energy 
you know, when I look at like uh, John Buscema's uh, layouts that he would do for, you know, 10 million anchors that inked him on the different Conan books every month, you look at those layouts and they are just pure energy and like there's a kineticness to them. They're loose. He, he hasn't made all the drawing decisions yet. And it, I think it's the mind filling in those gaps that gives us some of that electricity. It adds something to it that like, if you draw every little thing and you make every little decision, you're taking away some of that participation of the viewer. At least that's my current theory and it could be wrong. Um, but that's what I'm operating under at the moment. And there's probably a false premise or something that I'm not accounting for. But that's, that's my current belief, is that we have to have room for the viewer to participate in the piece. And I think, you know, it's backed up by, like, years and years of, of different artists who people say, like, well, I can draw like that. Uh, you know, I'm at least as good as that guy. So you're participating in the drawing, not just as a viewer, but as someone who's going to counter and you know, do something because of that piece. You've been motivated by that piece to do something really hard. And see, these plants are one of my go-tos. It's called an elephant ear. You know, they have these giant leaves that are shaped like this. And they used to grow wild near my parents' house. Sometimes I fake the, the plants, obviously, but, um, you know, sometimes when I want to draw a pretty flower or something, I will put um, real stuff in there. Like there's actually a, uh, a scene where a bluebell is actually quite important to it. And it's a little heavy handed because it's like comic book storytelling and like I'm using fantasy tropes to explain, you know, the human condition, which is ridiculous. But um, I think using things people recognize and can relate to in a world that's almost completely alien, like even in this book, when you read this book, if you read this book, sorry, um, you'll see that I've chosen to even change the way people Oh, thank you. Um, talk, you know, like I don't use, I try to stay away from, you know, um, modern and contemporary uh, derivations of language, of words, of abstractions, of the way people um, create labels for things because language is an abstraction. So like in, in such that and it's one that we all agree on. It's like this random ass shape that we have decided makes this sound. And that's how words are made by a co collection of sounds. And on a different world where they have different beginnings and endings and, and, and things going on, different religions, different people, different animals, like they wouldn't create all the same words that we use. So like when someone is talking, they're going to say some things that are a little different. And, um, you know, certain things that we create societally, certain structures to, you know, label or control people don't exist here. You know, like there's certain things that I've, I've just eliminated because I think there's such a modern concept that it would ruin the world building. It would, it would take you out of it. You know, it's kind of like when you're reading an old comic or watching an old movie and there's a pop culture reference that's out of place that's really dated and it gets cringy. So like it takes you out of that moment. And I, I, I don't ever want one of these stories to have that feeling that, you know, it doesn't belong to any time. And I'm trying to write undersea hero the same way, but, but comedy is a lot, a lot harder uh, for, for me. It is, you know, you can, create like giant lexicons and books of, you know, these are the words of, of what people say, or this is what this means. Like I'm watching a, a show right now called uh, Letter Kenny, and it's a, a show made in Canada and it's a, a comedy. It's a half hour comedy and, and they use it tons and tons of words and phrases in ways that, you know, Americans do not. And, um, the only reason I do okay on that show is because I played hockey forever and I, and I know the hockey slang. 
Um, and sometimes I have to translate some stuff for the wife. Bardownski's boys. Um, that's when you rip a slap shot and it hits one of the bars and comes down in the back. You know, chest rippers, you know, all, all kinds of stuff that they're common hockey terms even used in the States. But again, like these are completely different words that everybody, everybody uses. And there's some that I, plenty that I don't even know, like a, like Ferda. I didn't know what that meant, but it means Ferda boys on the team. We never use that phrase. Now, what I'm doing is right now is layering. She is not in total silhouette. So what we need to do is we need to frame around her and not lose any of what we need to show motion um, with shadow. So what I've done is, is I've layered it. So in the foreground where these plants are, where this little fella is, um, there's a lot of uh, silhouette. And uh, then the, in the mid ground where she is, there's not a lot. She's actually almost in silhouette. And right behind her, I actually go a step backward and actually open it up and have no silhouette with the trees, the first layer of trees. And then everything behind that will be a silhouette. It's going to be very dark and claustrophobic. And that's why when it opens up right here, this little bit of motion of this little fellow running into this bush, like where the, there will be some motion lines. And I know that some people think they're lazy, but I, I really like to use them when it comes to um, quick action. You know, I read too many Neil Adams comics as a kid, I guess, um, but I still think they're an effective way to uh, convey motion if you also get the body language. If the body language is stiff, the motion lines look stupid. And out of place. But yeah, this is this is what I'd be doing every, even if I was just all by my lonesome. And I'm I'm really glad I can because I've been doing so much other stuff lately that it's just like, oh yeah. Not that it's not worth it, and not that I don't need to pay my bills or anything. I'm, I'm thankful when I'm, I've got the work to be busy. But there's some days you just want to work on your own book. or at least when I do. And I was asked um, by my buddy Bill if Helena number two would be coming to Kickstarter. And, and I, I remain um, as I was before. Uh, I'm not gonna send the sing single issues to Kickstarter. Um, I'm gonna send the trade when we get to there in a couple of years to Kickstarter and I will get there. Mark my words, as long as I'm not, you know, dead or incapacitated, I will get the trade done. Then I'll ask for your money on, uh, on Kickstarter. And I, I kind of want to make it so that, you know, instead of just a kick, I'm thinking about making it so that the only way you could get the trade is on Kickstarter, but that might be unwise business decision. Like I can sell the single issues outside of it, but only the trade on Kickstarter or something. Unless some other publisher wants to do the trade, which who knows in this environment. How many issues will it be? It'll be the, the first arc is six issues. Um, one issue is a double-sized issue. And then I have a holiday story that I want to include because I, my first comic was a holiday issue. So it's gonna be six times 32 plus another. So yeah, it'll be around 220 pages or so. It'll be an expensive trade. Uh, you know, I make no bones about it. That's another reason why I can't do it on my own, like single issues. And Helen is a book I wanna just continue on to work on. like. I just find it so relaxing and enjoyable to draw a tough lady that kills monsters. And uh, she's really just, like I said in the interview, she's just trying to find out what makes her happy. And like right now she's on this quest and 
on this quest. I'm not going to give away what it is, but it does something that, and I've read a lot of goddamn fantasy books um, that I've never seen another book do. Um, I've read all the Tolkien offerings. I've read almost every Edgar Rice Burroughs book. I've read most of Ari e. Howard's output. Um, I've read tons, tons and tons of fantasy books, other random authors that put stuff out, shorts. And then after that, the status quo doesn't, you know. That was actually a different Helena. Yeah, that was a character, H-E-L-L-I-N-A. Yeah. Um, we we definitely do get uh, confused for one another from time to time. But, like, if you read the books, they're nothing alike. And, they, you know, the characters are pretty different, but it does happen. Um, yeah, there's his H-E-L-L-I-N-A. And mine's an E. Mine's just like the name Helen. With an extra L. Helena with an extra L. So, and I, I had no idea those books existed, so... Um, and I've been doing this book now for on and off for 10 years. So yeah, the first one I did, I actually showed it off earlier. This was, um, this was the ash can from years and years ago. Um, this is from, where is it? 2014. Yeah. There's the painting that Ralph Reese did for me. And, uh, there's one that Nate did. Nate Lovett. You know Nate. And uh, where's the Mike Bosberg? There it is. Mike Bosberg, who worked on. Uh, Tons and stuff for like all the Savage She Hulk issues, but one, uh, he won an Emmy for working on the Spawn cartoon. Yeah, he did all kinds of stuff. But yeah, 2014, I put out that first one. And I've commissioned a ton of uh, folks to do covers and pinups and all sorts of things. And I feel like I have invested enough to where it's like, okay, you really got to finish this stuff, man. Get your, get your stuff together and finish this. Because it really gets interesting after the first arc. Cause like I said, that the ending of the first arc, I've never seen in another fantasy, anything. I've seen a ton of movies. I've read long boxes of comics. Um, but you're not the first that, that has, has asked and I'm sure you won't be the last it's also one of the reasons I, you know, I just have pitched it around but I haven't really gone too too far with that you know, I did, I did for a while, take it to a couple of publishers and they were interested and we even got to where they were like planning series and everything else. And then COVID hit and, you know, pencils down for everybody and they ended up not doing it. So. And see, this is where I'm thinking as I go, you know, this, this leg is kicking. So there's going to be like some grass kicking up or little bits kicking up in front of me. Let's see how it looks so far. See, and now you can see how much cleaner that is. When I go in to ink it, all I got to do is erase this one layer of pencil and, you know, it's, it's easy.
Yeah, I didn't know you were doing comics all the way back then, Rodney. I mean, I knew you'd uh, done stuff before your current line of, of books, but I didn't know how far back it went. I was actually, I'm doing a show in Colorado Springs, and I was actually looking around to see if there were any minor league sports game, baseball games in the area. <laughs> Hey, had I known, we would we would have gone to that Dayton Dragons game. Left uh, left Nate and everybody to. Have dinner and then just met up with them afterwards. With the pitch clock, the baseball games are shorter. And that's about as far as I, I pencil a, a panel these days. The rest I, I do mostly in ink. You know, I continue drawing and adding to it. You know, I'll look at it. I want to have some gaps like this space. I don't want, I want to have space here where you see the foot cutting into it. And then, you know, down here, I want a little space too. There's actually like a little mound of dirt here that creates this little arc. But yeah, we'll just keep going. And this is a very in shadow cover that, you know, uh, panel that. Oh, wow, I never knew that. Started in 90. Wow, okay. So you got to see a little bit of that spec. You were you were in when there was a little bit of that speculator boom still left. Back when people were using multiple uh, distributors and uh, they could relist the same book, and you could have reorders. I actually remember when Diamond canceled doing that. It's cool, man. You know, I, I, I'm going to pick your brain with that stuff. Fifteen distributors. Did that book get newsstand distribution too? Or was it just a uh, direct market? I don't, you know, I obviously like I was just, that was just before I even started buying comics. Fifteen distributors and now down to like three or four in Kickstarter, so self distributing. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, when I started doing stuff for a local comic store around 2002, 2001, um, they ended up self-distributing because of the, the deal that Diamond offered them. Um, and it did fine. Like they sold a couple thousand copies of, you know, like a, a homemade book. But um, I remember those discussions. And this was after, you know, all of the others were, were gone. But that is awesome, man. Yeah, I remember when like American Entertainment and all those places where would have ads in a you know a comic book, and um, 
you know, they had signed editions with COAs for extra uh, money. And, you know, it really, they had like the best of both worlds where they had all the stuff that we, you know, currently offer through like a campaign. And then they also had like the newsstand and all that extra stuff to relist. That is cool. I did not know that. Just for funsies. Just for fun, I'm gonna do my panel border. I've always loved organic panel borders uh, for for fantasy or in horror, any anywhere where it adds to the the mood of the piece. I don't like it when it's just done all willy nilly. Um. <laughs> It was a youth well spent, I would agree. I'm actually starting a project soon with uh, my buddy Jeff where I'm gonna be doing no organic panels uh, for like the chunky lines. It's all gonna be like uh, French curves and uh, geometrics used. Uh, we might as well do the other one. I always like the way uh, J.H. Williams balanced his panels with geometrics uh, uh, breaking from the grid and clean line, but they still had an organic flow to them. And uh, that's that's what I'm the direction I'm hoping to achieve with the next next project with my pal Jeff. We don't have a publisher, we don't have anything lined up, we have no idea what we're doing with it, but I just wanna get going on some pages. I've been a little restless. The Iron Face stuff has been taking a long time to get going and the tick has been a, a, a constant pitch and struggle to get anything going with them. Man, I haven't seen those in a while, but I actually can look at, because um, I like the Alvin brand as well. I even still use their erasers, Alvin. Um, I have a local art supply where I've been able to buy old stock art supply that they never sold. It's a family run place. Next time I'm there, I will take a look. Um, or you're welcome to call them. Uh, the place is called Riverside. It's in Fall River, Mass. Uh, like they had stuff that I hadn't seen in like 20 years. And it was funny. I asked him about Zipatone and he said he had just like in the past, the first, when I first moved here, um, he had just thrown it out like a month prior. Um, but he had Letratone paper, which I have and I've messed around with. And the stuff is just like, it's, it's a bizarre paper. But again, like stupid old tools, but they also have a, a decent set of drafting tools, like just on the wall and some of them are dusty. So they might, I haven't taken the dive. Cause your work is super clean. So yeah, I could see why you would use a, a lot of curves and stuff. I'd be interested to know if you're inking. Uh,
Somerset. You're right. Yeah. It's it's the next town over. It's just over the bridge. Um, but yeah, they have a website. Um, they don't sell anything on the website, I don't believe. But they, you know, you can call them and uh, they're super nice. And I, you know, I, I try to support them. Uh, as much as I can, they, they do carry some of the ink and stuff that I use. So I'll go there and I'll buy that kind of stuff. Some things they don't carry and they don't carry the type of paper I like. So unfortunately I still order that. Um, whenever it's on sale on Blick, I just order as much as I have money. It's like, please take this paper money and turn it into drawing paper. And I'm sure they're just laughing at me. Ha ha ha. This fool trading money paper for drawing paper. Ha ha ha. And then, like I said, the uh, sound effects will be going on both sides here. And then this, this is a pure, uh, if you can, if anybody can guess what this, cre this, this, this is, um, cause this is a, a thing that exists on our planet. Um, I, I will send them a, a signed book or something so they can guess what it is. And like I said, I did give it away. On a, uh, on a post at one point. Because like this right here, this little bell, I'll absolutely have to use some uh, little curves to ink. Ronnie, do you, do you use French curves for everything? Or do you freehand stuff? Like the drawings I saw of some of the characters look like some of the inks were pretty organic. They were, they were freehand, but I don't know. Like the... Uh, the cute cat book. I'm sorry, the name is eluding me at the moment, but I bought it uh, for the Mrs. Last, uh, Last Gem City. I could see you using a, uh, a French curve for like every line in that book. And then this, like, I don't know, I guess I'll fill it in on camera, but normally I would just go like this, put a couple of X's. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's impressive. If you're doing mostly uh, by hand on that stuff, it's very, very clean. Normally that's how I denote, you know, something that's completely blacked out. I will probably also put my stupid little lines there. Hey, Ruben, that's great news. I'll, uh, I was planning on sharing it on the other platforms tomorrow. I'll s send it over on the YouTubes and such. I mean, we do have the first exclusive cover, so. And I'll send the, I'll make sure to put the links to everything when I post those sketch covers, because I was proud of that stuff, man. And I wanted to be, so. slowed me down on, on my, my pages and stuff, but that is okay. 
I wanted to do it. And do a good job. Let's see how we're doing. All right. Now here we're gonna need some real thick, juicy lines. There, flat in. And this, like everything here, is almost more just a fill. I'm gonna have like a rough edge. I'll probably use a dry brush right along the edge here and here. This will probably stay hard until there. Yeah. This is the first time I've done an exclusive for Helena as well. Um, I've done, I, I allow artists that work on the book if they wish to print their own cover. Um, and and um, Doug Paskovich did it, but that was only 25 copies. You're the first for sure, like I wanna do a, uh, an exclusive. Yeah, yeah. This is the first time someone has been like, I wanna like, do a whole print run of your book. So it's a big deal for me. So it's like, instead of just a handful of copies, you did a, you did a full run of a, 135 books. That's a huge deal. Um, but yeah, anytime anybody does a piece for me, if they want to use it for anything or if they want to print their own copies, I, I give them permission to do anything and everything. I, I, I believe getting indie books out there any way possible is uh, a good thing. But I make those only exclusive to um, the artists if they did something in the book. You're the first one that hasn't worked on the book um, in any way. Yeah, and uh, if anybody does a pinup, they can put it in their own uh, sketchbooks or art books or whatever. All I ask is that they, they just attribute the copyright properly. That's it. You know, you can make prints of it. You can do anything you want with it. And some people have made prints and sold them at shows, and that's great. That's just, uh, you know, that's really means they're proud of the work, and that means they're willing to put their name behind what they did uh, for the character. And that's, that means a lot. You know? uh, my uh, camera cord is oddly in the way tonight. Well, I want to get this glove right. I don't think it looks right, so we're going to have to do some drawing. I'm going to sit down. I've been standing this whole time. So we want to see from this angle, we are looking up a little bit. So. Yeah, you are by far the, the, the first vendor. Um, for sure. We did do one for Iron Face for a vendor, but for, for Rubber Chicken Comics. Great, great store out in Bellingham uh, for Jay. But I, I didn't have anything to do with the, I didn't have to order the print. <laughs> I just had to draw the pictures on that one. I'm psyched, man. I, hey, it's a huge deal for the for the book, and you know, I I think you picked the right uh, homage to homage. So, I do wonder. Do you think the? I did. Yeah, I did the whole book. Um, interiors, pencils, inks, colors, lettering. I did all the design, all the typesetting. I I, I did everything on that book uh, except. Uh, 
write the script and create the character and stuff. It's one of the reasons I keep bugging him to do more is because like I, I fell in love with it and I really poured myself into it. It's a very weird book. Um, I'm still surprised that there are people that take it seriously instead of as a, you know, the comedy that it is, but to each their own. I think that finger's too long. Take a look. It's back. This, this, yep, that one's too long. It has to come up some. There we go. That's better. I did draw a cover for um, the new Zodiacs that will be out at, um, that's Joe St. Pierre's book that will be out at Colorado Springs Comic Con. It's an exclusive for them um, of Joe's new issue that just came out through Kickstarter. And he just told me that the, you know, the books, books are, sh are shipped, I think. I try to stay on top of this stuff, but some days my brain goes goes to mush after about 3.30. Yeah, so if like, uh, I've been trying to figure out how to do that for writers too. I might have to come up with some sort of like licensing agreement that, you know, if a writer writes something for Helena or Undersea Hero, that they can just, if I draw it, they can reprint the story, you know, if they ever did like a collection of their own works or something. Because I want to I want to do it for writers, too. I think that, you know, even though they won't own the character, if they are proud of the work, I want them to be able to put it out there and use it for whatever can help them. Because it's going to help me if it's just out there. I was actually talking to a couple of writer friends of mine about writing some stuff. Hopefully I do really well at uh, Colorado and I make some money and I can hire my friends to write some things and draw some things. On top of, yes, paying the bills. Yeah, I'll do trades. I do trades for, for people all the time. And, uh, you know, I've hired plenty of folks to work on the book and, you know, that's, that's the way to do it. Hang out with your friends and make cool stuff with your friends. Like, especially when you got talented friends walking around. You know, and my, my circulation on, on my books, I, I've talked about this, is when I don't do Kickstarter, like it takes me longer to sell the books, obviously, just because I sell them, you know, a handful at a time to a store or one at a time to um, to readers. But my numbers, I think, it, historically, you know, um, are, are pretty good. Colorado is towards the end of... Uh, into August 20, let me look it up. I'll get yelled at if I say the wrong date. You can hear my sad, slow typing. Colorado Springs Comic Con, August 19th to the 21st. Let me see if they put my picture on. I don't know if they did. Uh, 
No, they didn't. So I guess I get to bring that up at the office tomorrow. Cool, cool, cool. I am hosting a panel um, at the show. They haven't announced that yet, and I don't think I can announce it here, but I will be hosting another uh, comic creator panel there. It's kind of become another gig for me when I do these things, because like, you know, most of these uh, panel moderators that um, I run into are well-versed in the celebrity uh, folks at the show, but when it comes to the comics, um, Hey, Desiree, um, that's not their area of expertise. So they'll, they'll bring me in to host a panel uh, for a comic book creator last year. And you can see it on my website. I got to host the uh, Hall, uh, Bob Hall panel. And uh, we talked about all sorts of stuff from Valiant to his time as an editor on the Spider-Man books, uh, Emperor Doom. He did the um, Marvel graphic novel. For that he did the he did the Marvel adaptation of that terrible '90s Captain America movie. His version, his comic version, is highly entertaining and a thousand times better than the movie. It's kind of a similar situation. It's like I don't know if anybody's ever read the um, Dolph Lundgren Punisher adaptation that uh, Brent Anderson did the artwork for it, and the artwork is terrific. And yeah. If, if what was on the paper there was the movie, it would be like one of those 80s action cult hit movies, for sure, like without a doubt, because it's more Punisher. And I think he even has the skull on in the comic book when he goes for the big finale. Some of those adaptations are great. Like I know the cartoonist kayfabe guys did the um, uh, Blade Runner adaptation, which Al Williams had did most of the artwork on it. But um, my buddy Ralph, uh, Ralph Reese inked a handful of pages in it. And yes, just flipping through the book, issue two, I can pick them out. Dan Green inked about a dozen and Carlos Garzon did uh, pencil assist, and I think he inked a fair amount of issue two as well. I think that's the work, how it was divvied up. And of course, the Al Williamson, you know, Empire Strikes Back uh, adaptation is just gorgeous. Getting a little warm in the studio, no AC in here. So if you see a drop of sweat, I apologize. Now see in this shot right here, this is one where line thickness is really gonna come into play because I want her to be in the foreground, but then we also have this uh, branch in front of her. So this will have like really chunky lines on it. And then especially her hand coming forward will have really thick lines around the outside to push it forward towards the viewer and actually push back the things behind it. You know, having the weighted lines on the underside of a curve is like the traditional way to do a lot of stuff. But I, I, I have now come into the, like the belief that, if you're really pushing the foreground, midground, background, if you if you mind your line weights there, you can really just accentuate it. <laughs> yeah, yes. It's very likely tonight, I believe.
Maybe. I think there needs to be a break there. Got a little dagger. <sighs> I need to take a third shower today. And my normal one in the morning I had a workout. Got a shower after that, but I need to get another one. One thing I try to make obvious when coloring uh, Helena for sure is that she's not wearing makeup. In this case, we once again have a little bit of motion where she's actually like, if we were to put motion lines here, which I, I'm debating on, but I don't know if I will because there's this tree here. It'd be the classic like turning her head lines. But I think that that would interrupt the sound effect movement that we're putting through here. Uh, one of the TV shows I like watching is actually uh, got its premiere episode tonight, Reservation Dogs. I think that's a terrific show. I think tonight is the season two premiere. Yeah, he, uh, he was a great announcer. I mean, he was around for, he, he lived a full life. He had some of the greatest calls in MLB history. So I'm sure, I'm sure the Dodger fans have all the flags at half mast. Yeah, generally, I use the uh, the money from conventions, if, you know, after bills and stuff for, you know, if I'm buying anything like for my PC, like a piece of artwork or, you know, a, um, 
her and my buddies. I could show a couple of the pinups from, uh, I actually have them right here, hold on. Yeah, like here's one that uh, Paris Collins did. Um, it's just absolutely gorgeous. And uh, Sean Forney colored this one. Um, here's the layout for the Mike Vosberg piece. Um, and here's one that Daryl did. Daryl Banks. Yeah, there's some of the folks that I've bothered to draw my stuff. It's always fun seeing how people, different people see your character. You know, some people draw, her, you know, as an action character, other people try to draw her more as like the, the pin up character, which, you know, I let people draw whatever they want usually. So I've only ever had to make like, I think two edits. Um, just because there were some things that I thought were a little egregious, but, but in the history of, I think working with, dozens of artists at this point that's a pretty low rate because I try to pick people that I know are really good and uh, like their work and I just tell them like hey you can't kill off the main character it's, it's, or either of her buddies that she's currently traveling with and usually my prompt is like hey uh, have her fighting a monster or something Another thing that I've worked on really is like, if I'm going to show little pieces of uh, little bits of detail like that, it's got to line up with the, the structural part of her skull correctly. So not all of these will translate into ink lines. It's really just helping me to see. I'm hoping to, Desiree. That's that's what I would like to do. You know, I am um, hoping I can either get a spot or at least get a badge to walk around with.
I've never been good at standing in the digital line, so. Hey, thanks, Jonathan. I'll catch you later, man. Congrats on the, the, the very cool uh, Dan Jurgens pickup. I'm gonna have to check. I'm gonna have to bug you to check it out at some point. That sounds awesome. Well, I think I'm gonna go go myself here. I just want to thank you all for coming to check out uh, my stream and chat with me. I always look forward to chatting. Rodney, thanks for coming to your first uh, live stream here, man. That was really cool having you. And uh, learning more about your career. I'm going to have to pick your brain some more. Um, and if Eli is still here, I think he, I think he's a, I think he's more of a, a drive-by guy. I think he pops in for like two seconds and keeps on flying. But uh, I'll show you how far we got. But okay, I got to work on this face a little bit, soften. I think some of the edges up a little bit, but that's the beauty of being in the pencil stage. I can always go back and erase and uh, take things up. I'll once again show the uh, layout. This is where we're gonna get to do. Yeah, seriously. Um, spotted all the blacks. Hopefully it carries the eye through. Um, but yeah. And my buddy Ruben, like I said, IRF Authentics, if you want to get the first issue with the fancy schmancy variant cover. Thanks so much, Rodney. And yeah, we're going to have to talk some more. I got to I gotta steal some of your knowledge. Um, but yeah, the, the link is in the description to the uh, Instagram page. And the Instagram page has like all the info, the whatnot, and it's got the interview. And, uh, you know, I'm really excited. There's, and I'm going to post some of the sketch covers this week. I, I really, I really tried to deliver some cool stuff. So um, I will see you next week. Thank you all. And uh, yeah, I hope you have a lovely night. Bye, everybody.